The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Welcome to Sirius XM's Cars and Culture. I'm Jason Stein in Detroit. There's a not-so-quiet automotive success story brewing north of the United States border. It's a startup company, of sorts. It's a calling card for the Canadian automotive industry, sort of. It's a project that is as dynamic as it is unique. The development of a vehicle that was conceived, created, and built, not by a car company, but by an association. On that remarkable fact, there is no question. It's called Project Arrow, and this arrow is pointed directly at all elements of cars and culture, the auto industry in Canada that was nearly dead, as well as the cultural fabric of a nation trying to reinvent itself. And at the Consumer Electronics Show, where it made its debut in January, it raised more than a few eyebrows. So we're here at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas to show off Project Arrow. Uh, this is a showcase of Canadian automotive technology, both externally and internally, hardware and software. So tell the Canadian EV story to the world. We haven't had a new Canadian uh, car company in 100 years, but we have one of the world's largest clusters of automotive manufacturing, critical minerals for battery technology, and for uh, information technology. Project Arrow, an all-electric SUV with hefty horsepower and loaded with technology, is the brainchild of the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association. Their leader is a very charismatic and incredibly committed man named Flavio Volpe. Volpe took Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's challenge of a commitment to zero emissions vehicles very seriously, rallying his Parts Association members, as well as former automaker executives, designers, and manufacturers to create Project Arrow. The result has generated enormous interest around the world, some 100 interviews globally and counting. It's a story of perseverance, but it's also a story of how one man's mission to rebuild a nation's car industry with one vehicle may lead to a future filled with more innovation and a manufacturing cultural shift for an entire country. The Project Arrow story from inception to production, how one country rallied behind a concept and turned it into reality and might lead to even bigger things in the future. Hi, I'm Flavio Volpe, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. He's a pioneer in the automotive space, and it's not called Rivian, it's not called Tesla, but he's number one on the media charts with an arrow. Haha. <laughs> Flavio Volpe, welcome to the program. Congratulations on your latest launch. Appreciate that. It's been a bit of a whirlwind, and... Uh... You know, I, I I didn't think it was going to be this uh, catch this much fire, but I think there's such an appetite for good stories in this business, and such an appetite for Canadiana on this side of the border that uh, you know, kind of we hit both uh, by accident, and a lot of people talking about cars now uh, that weren't before, and so I think uh, we're making an impression. Can I go back to 2020? You agreed to spearhead what was going to be the first original full build zero emission concept vehicle in response to a call out yeah by a rather famous individual well known individual certainly uh north of the border and south of the border too sure what did prime minister justin trudeau say to you what 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 was the inspiration for all of this we've got this tradition here that when we open a session of you know our congress here the legislature we have a throne speech and the throne speech is the government saying, these are our priorities. But within it, you know, I was invited up as a guest of the prime minister. I said, show me what a uh, what a, a net zero industry looks like for 2050. And, you know, we thought, what can we do to answer that, to pick up that gauntlet and, and run with it with something that answers with emphasis? sat around with the team around here and said, we'd long theorized that in Canada, in spite of the fact that we don't have an, uh, our own Canadian automaker, we make 2 million cars a year here for American and, and Japanese automakers. So I think we make everything in a vehicle from bumper to bumper. So we went back and said, 
here's our answer. We're going to show you what 2025 looks like. We're going to build, we're going to design, engineer, and build a fully Canadian vehicle to 2025 model year specs. And we need three years. We'll see you, um, we'll see you at CS in 2023. Now, the world fell apart in between, and there was a whole bunch of challenges. Say, there, was, there was a small event that occurred <laughs> in the middle of that. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? We stuck to it, and we accomplished uh, our goal. Uh, as it turns out, you can't get display screens for automotive in Canada, so I can't say it's 100% Canadian. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a call out. Eh? Anybody here in Canada that uh, didn't bid uh, on putting display screens, uh, we're happy to retrofit. <laughs> but but you know, it's a rolling uh, it's a rolling prototype. Everything works, and it's designed to showcase that. Hey, you know what? We may not have a car maker here, but it's not for lack of of technological know how. And the people here, and uh, the the creativity or the balls to dream, and so we, so you know, everybody saw Project Arrow uh, last month at uh, in Las Vegas, but it's on a two year tour. We're going to show everybody. What did Prime Minister Trudeau say when he saw it? Do you know it's funny? Um, so we unveiled it in Las Vegas. He wasn't there. Two days later, I head to Mexico City for the Three Amigos Summit. Uh, 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 Biden, Obrador, Trudeau. So first meeting we have, he said, I saw it. I saw you. And I said, even better, let me show you. And I pulled out a picture and he said, this is wonderful. And we, we posed for official pictures. And I said, hold on, let me hold up a picture of the arrow. And I said, we're still waiting for you. I need you to, I need you to see it. I'm going to bring it to you in Ottawa where you come see it at the Toronto auto show. And he said, did you do it? Is it working? I go, it works, man. This is a car. And I said, now I'm going to drop a gauntlet back on you when you see it. And so I don't want to scoop myself, but, uh, but, uh, when he sees me, we're going to have, uh, we're going to have a pretty tough conversation on what's next. I did my part. Yeah. We'll get into what's next in a little bit, but let's start with the name project yeah. arrow. The yeah. name's got some history behind it. Doesn't it? Yeah. You know, Airlines. Canadians. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to show you something here. Look, Canadians, we all grow up studying about this fighter jet, you know, uh, called the Avro Arrow. It was designed in the fifties by a company that had a clean sheet from the Canadian air force to say, look, how are we going to intercept Russian bombers that come over the Arctic to attack the Americans? Um, what do we have in stock? Could we possibly, uh, do we have a credible defense? If we don't, what would you do with a clean sheet? And this company wins, with this incredible design of a of a of a fighter jet that they launched in 1957, that flew twice as high as anything the Americans or the Soviets had at the time, and twice as fast, and it was, you know, the pride of 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 Canadian industry. Uh, it, it really became a bit of a of a pop culture reference here, and it was. Uh, you know, kind of the proof point that we had that we could compete with anybody based on technology and personnel and imagination. 11 months after that first flight in 1957, the new government, it was a government change, and the new government canceled it. And didn't just cancel it, said all of a sudden uh, it's canceled. The program is owned by the Canadian government, so you have to let go of everybody today. And uh, February 20th, 1959, today, and uh, by the way, you have to crush all the all the jets that you made, and there were six of them, hmm. and and there were another four coming, and uh, by the way, you gotta you gotta tear up all the designs that we're gonna buy Bullmark missiles from the Americans, and that's it. And it was one of these things. It's a story in Canadian in Canadian history of what we could have, should have, would have done. And we didn't, uh, but for the lack of will. And we thought this, you know, the organization I represent, the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association, used to be the Automotive and Aircraft Parts Manufacturers Association. We were founded in 1952. A bunch of our members were on that original jet fighter program. And we wow. said, we said, you know what? And we're going to show the prime minister and the rest of the world that we can compete on technology. Let's call it Project Arrow. And let's do something uh, to avenge some of that history. Yeah, incredible story. Yeah. Some headlines referred to Project Arrow as a moonshot, yeah. a big, <sighs> audacious goal. When you unveiled it at CES in January, were you tempted to call it mission accomplished? 
Do you know the? Pre- <laughs> I got to tell you. You know, I've I've been around long enough to remember that uh, that W put that up on the screen behind him and it haunted him. But it did feel like that. You know, it was we're a trade association. I think sometimes people, as we, as you look at this project and you and you read the story, you know, it's a prototype, and you say, well, you made a prototype. Uh, you know, hard, tough times, and uh, you managed to wade through a pandemic, but you did it. But if I tell you that we're a trade association with 14 people here, that that usually does lobbying and a whole bunch of other stuff, and say that we we built a functioning prototype with all commercially ready technology, it is a bit nuts. And um, <laughs> And, you know, for that moonshot, I, I, I joked, we had to hire some astronauts, you know, we went out and recruited, um, with the help of a guy named Marcello Grassi, Dr. Marcello Grassi he used to be, I met him when he was a lightweight, uh, lead at McLaren. And he said, look, if you're going to do a marketing exercise, don't bother. If you're going to build a car, then you've got to have some rigor. You've got to have the people that understand how to build, uh, one-offs. Uh, in a very short period of time at a level of quality that is demonstrable to customers. And I said, well, who are you talking about you? And he said, no, not me, uh, but I'll, I'll guide you. But, but there's a gentleman uh, named Fraser Dunn, who's the chief engineer at uh, 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 for special projects at Aston Martin. That's right. Aston and, Martin. Yep. And, and he had just finished the Valkyrie program. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I said, well, I'll talk to him, you know, you know, just sometimes you take a shot. I'll talk to him. You know, he's, this guy's a dream job. You know, the conversation, um, I thought was a little bit more fruitful than just information. So we took a shot and I said, do you want to be the chief engineer? And, you know, I really shortening the story, but eventually the answer was yes. And I knew then the guy who, you know, did the Valkyrie, the, the Vulcan, uh, vanquish, you know, DBS, DB9. Incredible vehicles. Yeah. 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 I mean, dream cars. Um, he, he lent immediate credibility to the engineering exercise. And because of that, it made it a lot easier for a lot of us to recruit the other people that needed to come in, in an advisory capacity, uh, uh, turning wrenches, but really more importantly, all these suppliers who I said, Hey, by the way, we're going to do this, but I don't have money, Hmm. but you have money. We're going to put together a car and I'm going to go out and get some, uh, public sector support. The federal government gave us $5 million. The, the Ontario government gave us just short of two and the Quebec government, uh, gave us one and a 1.4. And I said, uh, but I'm probably going to need like 10 or $12 million worth of contribution, uh, on, on parts, research and development, one-off tooling, uh, engineering integration. And I'll tell you what, having a guy like Fraser at the center of the engineering, having Ralph Giles be our chief uh, juror on our design competition. We've had him uh, on the show. Yeah. Great. Design. Oh yeah. Yeah. Great guy. I, by, I, you know, I said to him, look, Hey, by the way, I have a demon. And then before that, uh, I have a couple of uh, a grand Cherokee SRTs. And before that, a charger SRT and a 300 SRT. I love your stuff. You've got the right eye. You're our guy. And he's got a great story. You know, grew up in Montreal. This, yes. this is your, he jumped right in. So anyway, our ability, you know, we've got our CTO here who you know quite well, Colin Dillon. You know, he helped really convince those guys that we weren't nuts. And then bringing them on, they helped convince the industry here that, yeah, this is a this is a viable project that's got an honorable goal and and there's some business to be had from it. And, you know, here we are. Is the purpose of it to be a rolling calling card for the Canadian industry? Is that how you would describe it? Yeah, that, that is, that's the scope of the project. It's why we needed the design to be originally Canadian. First of all, it needs to be original. And then if we're going to, we're going to highlight Canadian technology, then that design had to come from a Canadian source. We ran a design competition with post-secondary students, only college and university students, 24 submissions, nine on a short list, three on a really short list. Uh, and, uh, we've picked this great group, these, these four boys, I say they're boys. I mean, they're young men now, but you know, three years ago, four boys out of Ottawa's, uh, Carleton university of design had this incredible, uh, design and, and, and we engineered to 2025 model year specs. Uh, but it, it, it stayed really true to their original vision. And so we had great engineering teams here. Yes. Uh, you know, we, we Fraser was the lead, but you know, we have great, uh, team 
both at uh, Windsor Essex VR Cave to kind of do it virtually first and then and work with Ontario Tech University's great engineering team. Um, and then engineering skunk work teams and all these suppliers. So what we said was, we're going to build one car, but it's got to be built as a working prototype so that when we take it around the world, and we've already spoken to 14 automakers about the tech that's on it. When we take it to Toyota or we take it to Ferrari, I'm bringing you a showcase that says everything that you look at, every system that you're working with, everything that you touch is available and we want to supply you and it's in Canada. Now, you've had more than a hundred interviews from yeah. around the world. I think as we, as we do this interview, what are we? A hundred and hundred, 102, 102 or 102. Yeah. yeah just since the launch does it surprise you that the world is so interested or what surprises you about that i gotta tell you i I had this conversation with a very dear friend the day before i said i don't know if it's gonna be a dud like yes great it's great exercise you know you guys are trade association look looks nice you'll go on your commercial tour and that's it or when we pull the sheet back are people going to like really like the car and feel a kinship to it um, it's like three times what that second scenario was. Carlos Tavares showed up for the f- at the reveal during uh, at CS. It's funny, I, we we I'm I'm there. I pull the sheet, uh, and somebody's whispering to me. You know, we've got a few hundred people around it. You know, you're kind of in the, the hallways between the booths uh, at CS, and they're like, Carlos Tavares is here. I'm like, what do you mean, Carlos Tavares? I'm, I'm, I'm I literally have a mic talking to people, and they're like. Like, Carlos Tavares here. Like, well, I'm kind of busy, <laughs> you know. Hey, I got I thought, a car to unveil here. Yeah, but I thought, you know what? Uh, you know, the objective of this car is to sell stuff to people like Carlos Tavares. I hand the mic to Colin, who did. I mean, he did. I mean, he's he's our he's our tech guru. He went through the whole thing. Well, right behind the car, if you see the pictures of the event. I'm talking to Carlos Tavares, and you know, I'll save you the details of that conversation. But the fact was. What is this? What's on it? Uh, do we already do business with them? What about the ones we don't? How do we do it? I'm like, this is it. This is exactly why we did this. And um, I am surprised uh, by two things. The the global interest in a car. And and I really don't have my I, I really don't have my thumb on it. I don't understand. Um And there's an incredible Canadian interest here, a wider general population that is interested in a Canadian moonshot who aren't car guys and girls who uh, have been inspired to pay attention, chase me down in some cases and ask me if they can buy one, uh, try to figure out whether we actually, like, did you actually build it? You guys are a trade association or who did it? Who's your real partner? Does it really work? The interest is off the charts. I can't, I can't really go anywhere without running into somebody who, uh, who I don't know, asking me about it. And it's going to, I mean, that's going to mushroom in the next three weeks because it's the feature car at the Toronto auto show where 300,000 of my neighbors are going to see it over a couple of weeks. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Do you think the prime minister envisioned a 550 horsepower, 82 and a half kilowatt battery vehicle with level three autonomy? <laughs> Cause that's well, what it is. <laughs> yeah. You know what? It's funny. Um, the first meeting we had when we launched it, we went to, uh, ABC technologies, one of our, one of our chief suppliers here, and they're a big Stellantis supplier and they're a big, um, uh, Dodge makes uh, the LX cars up here, Charger, Challenger, uh, uh, 300. And I showed him when he came, I said, look, these cars are made in Canada, and I want you to know that car over there is mine, and it's a a Dodge Demon. It's the fastest car in the world. And he said, you don't need to make the fastest electric car in the world. And I said, you watch. And so when we sat around with the specs, we literally – we went through that conversation and went through with the team here, including Fraser, who said, I mean, how many motors do you want in it? And I said, it's got to be credible, man. I, you know, I don't drive anything slow, <laughs> but we, if we go three motors here, bring back a thousand horsepowers, I think we probably will have uh, made the wrong message. But I told him he, you know, he's a car guy. He's got a, 
He's got his father's car, which is a 1961 Mercedes SL convertible. Wow. And, and I said, better than your car. I'll tell you what, it's faster than your car. <laughs> I'll take you on. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the car for yeah. those who have not seen it. It's yeah. a crossover, yeah. but it's so much more. It, it is. What, what we said was when we did the original design brief, we thought, okay, look, if, 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 if the, if what we need to do here is feature Canadian technologies um, and in a credible platform, let's take the fastest growing segment uh, in this market and one that's big enough for us to feature a whole bunch of technologies, hard and soft technologies. And we've been working with, um, amongst other OEMs, Toyota Canada for a long time to demonstrate technology. And I, I said, the benchmark for what we're doing is built here in Ontario, just up the street from me the number one rated plant in the world uh, for initial quality and productivity is a plant where Toyota decided in 2005 to make their Lexus product the first time outside of Japan. So they make RX, NX, and Toyota RAV4. And I said, that's the benchmark. And it's also the benchmark in terms of content. As we did the NAFTA renegotiations and, you know, we're really on the forefront on, how we push the regional value content equation, you know, how much Canadian, American, and Mexican content. Toyota had the highest local content there. And I said, um, let's build something that you might imagine to be an electrified Lexus RX product or for it to be absolutely credible to answer the question, of, would you build a second one? Would you build a thousandth one? Would you be, I say to people, um, people get really excited about patriotic national product projects until they got to pay for one. Yeah. Right. And when you're <laughs> going to buy one, that's what you buy in that, at that price point in that segment. So we, so we said to all of our suppliers using that as the benchmark, don't give me an obtainium. Imagine the vehicle that we build is going to be built at 50,000 a year for under $60,000 Canadian. And so give me your best innovation that's saleable so that when I sit in front of Volkswagen and I show them uh, your system, it's one that their procurement people might be interested in or uh, Toyotas or Fords or General Motors. So, so that's what we built. And there's um, 58 suppliers on here, one of them not Canadian, uh, that uh, we think have uh, debuted 25 automotive technologies in partnership with each other or on their own. And, you know, we've, we've talked about a bunch and I'm happy to talk about a bunch here, but part of this is a, because it's not a consumer product. It's not a, not for enthusiast coverage. It's like, there's some top secret stuff there that some of our suppliers want to put on Ferrari. Right. Right. Well, you've, you have incredible uh, technology in here. You've got telematics yeah. baked in, health monitoring yeah. software, yeah. chassis 3D printed. You've incorporated artificial intelligence. Yeah. You really blank slated this. Yeah. Share some of the innovations. Share sh share some of the cool stuff. So, so let me take it from a few different angles. What we said was, um, if this is if these are existing suppliers with commercially ready technology for 2025, don't you don't have to come up with stuff that newly patented and see uh, if people are interested. Let's think about a different orientation, sensor technology, uh, camera technology, uh, AI, machine learning, um, uh, advanced textile technologies uh, in the steering wheel and the seats. We said, why don't we wrap this in, a, in, in an envelope, you know, Colin's idea, vehicle as a caregiver. And so we use the theme here, you know, healthcare is a real big, we think a differentiator culturally here in Canada, we have, we have public healthcare and that we really, we have an emphasis on uh, how we treat uh, everybody equally. I don't know whether you believe that happens or not. I say in the car, we say, look, if I've got a level three autonomous car, uh, teasing into level four, uh, what can we do differently for the passenger experience and the driver experience for someone who has chronic health conditions, an emergency health condition, is involved in an accident that creates an, um, uh, some type of uh, 
single moment acute condition. And all of these technologies are trained on the people who are in the car that respond to uh, different situations that uh, change the ambiance in the car, the, the, the positioning in the car, what the car will do, uh, where it needs to go. If you're holding the steering wheel, we've got technology from a company called Myant that is constantly monitoring your vitals. Some of that is also in the, in the seats that are done uh, by, um, by a company called uh, Woodbridge that's got seats and everything from Porsche Macan to my, uh, my uh, Dodge Demon. Um, a, a whole bunch of technologies that are then platformed on, a, on an AI leaders uh, platform uh, like um, a GeoTap that is uh, in real time taking all of that data and processing it into action actionable uh, packets, whether that's in the car, outside the car, connected to the, the intelligent um, uh, infrastructure. On the outside or on the, on the operation of the vehicle, we worked with, uh, with a battery company called Volta Explorer, and we worked with, um, with a photovoltaic company called Cap Solar, and we said, okay, look, um, battery technology, we're not going to reinvent battery technology. We want to prove that you can do um, credible, scalable lith lithium ion uh, 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 cell batteries uh, for uh, automotive use here, but we want to give a, a, uh, a extended uh, range um, uh, narrative for, you know, the Canadian weather here, which, you know, in, in July is 105 degrees here in Toronto. And then uh, today it's, uh, you know, if it's 10 degrees, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll buy you lunch. And so, so this company Volta Explorer is using uh, graphene to enhance the cath graphene enhanced cathodes and anodes for range extension that works with the the whole roof is a is a cap solar photovoltaic cell that uh, you know uh, helps power some of the accessories when you're static, but also the two of them working together to get to what we think after testing to be, you know, a material high single digits, low double digits extension on the range of that 82 kilowatt uh, battery. Wow. It's a DeLorean from back to the future. Yeah. Yeah. With a bigger engine, right? With That's a bigger was, engine. <laughs> you know, no no it, slow cars here. Can it go toe to toe with other EVs, the likes of Tesla or Volkswagen or Ford or GM? Well, it needs to, and because what we said, so almost all of our suppliers, especially the, 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 the hard volume suppliers already supply those companies. And so what we're saying is give me your stuff. We'll put it together on this vehicle. And then we will have tech days with Tesla, Volvo, GM, and that we'll put it in a package that is uh, uh, competitive with those contemporaries, you know, just like we said, uh, you know, Lexus RX and um, uh, RAV4 is a benchmark in terms of the amount of car you get for that price. You know, we 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 did not ignore uh, Tesla Model 3 and how the market responds to Tesla Model 3. What are the features in Tesla Model 3 that make it so popular? Now, you know, the valuation of the company is not based on its PE ratio. I mean, it is... 10 times uh, its PE ratio is, 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 is uh, 10 times out of whack. But why do people like Model 3? What are they like? Why? Uh, what is it about Ionic 5 that is getting people excited? Uh, Ionic 5, it's here's a company that makes uh, a group that makes 8 million cars a year that is offering a uniquely designed almost like a squared off hot hatch, even though it's a CUV mm -hmm. that's immediately recognizable at a price point that is very competitive to the market leader, uh, uh, Tesla model three and with a kind of range performance, a range in performance that's, that is, uh, uh, competitive. And so what we said here was that those, those cars designed from scratch as, electric vehicles and what you can do with the ergonomics and the way that the design is, you know, that our lead designer, a guy named Richard seal, uh, was a guy who laid out the interior for the Virgin galactic, uh, spaceship. And it's that, you know, you talk about autonomous cars, you know, there's someone who understands you know, different ergonomics. And so we, 
absolutely have to be competitive. It's a long answer for you. Have to be competitive because the same those companies are now going back to Tesla and saying, "Well, whatever your Model three, Tesla Model Three Point One is, please consider our components." Mission accomplished, indeed. Yeah. Have any automakers given you feedback personally outside of Mr. Tavares at the stand at CES? Uh, we've talked to 14 OEMs right now, and we've set up, uh, as of right now, we've got four OEM tech days uh, in the books, meaning we'll bring the car, we'll bring the suppliers, they'll bring out their engineering procurement design people. We did one a few years ago with uh, with another mock-up that we did that wasn't all original. It was us putting stuff on a on a Toyota Canada vehicle. Uh, we went to the Rotunda at Ford, and 275 people came through in eight hours. Um, almost all of the uh, senior executives at uh, uh, at these car companies have said to us that this was very bold. Then uh, we we get into an initial conversation of the mix of suppliers that are on it and the mix of new technologies, and they're very excited to see it. You know, I'm in the uh, I'm in the baseball business. You know, I coach baseball and I coach. Oh, I know boys we're going to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, but what we say in in that business, we put together a, a team of boys, very skilled boys, and we say to big colleges and professional teams, "Come see our team." It isn't just you get to see the center fielder and he's great. It's I'm going to bring it all to you, and you might be interested in five or six or ten of them. And we're using a lot of that same principle with this. You, you, you may just be looking at powertrain technologies. Um, and so we'll bring those seven companies. But, you know, while you're there, take a look at the other 51. It, it, it really is a great shortcut for uh, a whole bunch of those procurement teams uh, to uh, get a whole bunch of, of info from commercially ready, scalable companies uh, at once. You were just named one of the top 100 most influential people in government and politics in 2023. And you said, not bad for that guy that used to be the kid with the big mouth. Yeah. <laughs> who, yeah told my, you, who told you you had a big mouth? My mother. My mother. <laughs> you know, Is it good ma- to have a big mouth? <laughs> well, it wasn't then. When she was saying it then, she said, you got a big mouth. It's going to get you into trouble. And I said, Ma, where do you think I learned that from? From you. <laughs> and my mother was... My mother was that that sweet Italian lady that when you had to go into a big fight, you'd go and find her and she wouldn't be there because she's already landed that first punch. <laughs> and I think she thought, you know, I have, I have three siblings and she thought, you got a big mouth, man. Someone's going to punch you in it. And I, as some of that big mouth is, I think, what they pay me to do here. And that... And the one thing that I always did as a kid, um, I do now is you won't hear different things from me publicly than you hear from me privately. I'll give you candor, but I'll be the first guy to say to you, good job. Did some great work. You inspire me. Um, and, and, and I won't be, you know, I may be critical, but I'll be respectful. And I think, I think some of that I've learned from others, uh, but it's, you know, uh, I think we're short on that in, in politics and government, at least in this country. And I'm not going to judge other countries. And so somebody decided to put me on a list, even though I'm not a politician or hold a public office. Um, it's an honor. My father was a member your of parliament. Thing. Yeah, Joe yeah. Joe Volpe, your dad, yeah. was in the cabinet of former Prime Minister Paul Martin. Yeah. What kind of influence did he have on you, including the businessman who you have become? Joe Volpe is, um, he wasn't the soft guy, right? He, although, I mean, uh, he loves his children for sure. I, don't know, I see he loves his grandchildren. I'm like, hey, a little bit of that sprinkled a generation back would have really helped. But he, <laughs> he, he, he was a, he was a leader in the community. He was the guy that you would go to, uh, when you had no other options and he always delivered and never, ever asked for anything from anybody else. He had the reputation amongst my friends, my colleagues, his colleagues, as he's the back wall. And um, best teacher I ever had, brilliant. 
smartest guy I've ever met in my life is my dad. I know people say that and they come on. Honestly, if you know my dad, you say, yeah, uh, I mean, he's got the gray matter. Uh, but never let me down. And it's important. You know, you take a leadership role and you're that last line of defense. You can't afford to be flaky. You can't be the guy who says, not this time. Uh, it's a it's a responsibility I take seriously. And then I learned at the feet of the master. Yeah. You studied at the University of Toronto, international relations degree. You also played yeah. varsity baseball there, as you said. You don't lead a major auto association or take on Project Arrow without drive. Yeah. Is baseball where you developed your competitive drive? And more importantly, what kind of ball player were you? Well, this arm over here used to throw 87 miles per hour in the early 90s, you know, and I keep saying to the boys I coach now, hey, man, if I had access to the stuff that you have now, if I had a coach like you have now, if I get on the road, if the, if the reward, if that carrot was as big as it is for you right now, maybe that 87 would have been 91 and it had gone somewhere else. My dad put his hand on my shoulder at uh, the end of high school and he said, you're going to the University of Toronto. And... I thought, well, that's the end of baseball. And they had a great, they, they, they had a great program there. And we played uh, D1 and D2 schools in the U S even though it was a Canadian school and we won as many times as we lost. Uh, but you know, you learn a little bit of, uh, a little bit from that camaraderie, that pressurized camaraderie, uh, that, that training and that discipline, if you want to get better. And then we used to line up against the best. There's a guy, and I reached out to him uh, a couple of years ago. His name is Joe Musgrove. I, I hope he sees this. I go pitch at Columbus Clippers Stadium. It's the Yankees AAA Stadium in a D1 tournament. This guy comes up to bat, and his batting average says 506. And I said, well, this guy must be like uh, 8 for 15. He was 80 for 159. Ooh. And 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 he came up against me four times. He hit four line drives that almost took off my head. He went four for four off me. And uh, I looked at him and I said, this guy is the benchmark, man. I couldn't get anything past. Didn't matter what I did. Same guy, same pitcher, all game, owned me. I stuck with me forever. I tell that story to the boys that 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 I coach. I'm like, you know, you think you're hot stuff. And then some random guy out of nowhere is hotter better than you, probably worked harder than you. Well, I looked him up a couple of years ago on LinkedIn. I sent him a message. I said, you won't remember, but you taught me a big lesson there. I looked him up. He went to some place called Allegheny College in Pennsylvania. He's a Hall of Famer at Allegheny College. Mm. And it's it's that lesson. You know, I'm, I'm also, I spent a lot of time at the track a uh, quarter mile at a time when I was younger with cars that I would break and burn all my money with. And there's always somebody faster. Usually it's a guy with more money, but maybe somebody wants it more than you and he's willing to sacrifice other things with that limited amount of money. And so, you know, I take some of that ethic here, some of it, I'm going to be a little bit more compassionate to you than, than when you were, when you were a competitive athlete, but you know, your son has an interesting story, a baseball story. He's perhaps dreaming of major leagues as well, isn't he? He's better than his father. We'll start with that. And, and that happened years ago. He's, uh, you know, he played soccer when we were younger, when he was younger. And I didn't really want to coach baseball. I coached it for, for a couple of decades. And I thought, I'm not coaching my son. That's not going to be good for either one of us. Uh, great soccer player quits. He quits at like eight years old. And I said, kid, you got to do something. I don't care what it is, but you got to pick something. Picks baseball, plays house league terrible i mean I, he's gonna watch it he was awful <laughs> and i remember seeing him before he was going up to bat i go do me a favor hey like you're angry he calls time in the box comes out comes back to me at the fence he goes what if i'm happy i'm like oh my god this guy's just... <laughs> so uh the next week uh, none of his coaches were there i coach him he gets a couple hits i said what happened he goes i like when you're here i said well do you want me to coach you yeah i go then we're gonna do it my way and my way means enjoy it, love it, whatever, but you're going to hit every single day. We're going to set up a net in the basement You're going to hit at least a bucket every single day for the rest of your life. And I said, you're going to, it's just going to, when you hold the bat, it's just going to be different. And so he's done that for, uh, eight years now. And so last, 
uh, September, played in the World Cup for Italy. We're dual citizens. Team Canada didn't call. He's 17 years old. He was too young. We went to, to the World Cup. Uh, he was third on the team in hitting. He got, uh, if he was on Canada, he'd be second on the team in hitting. We play Canada. We beat Canada. Place higher than Canada. I was a little conflicted, but not that conflicted. He opened the hitting, got four <laughs> hits against the world number four Mexico, and got uh, a few Division One scholarship offers. And he's going to go to a wonderful place called Lindenwood University in uh, St. Charles, Missouri. And uh, the they're the Lions. And for years, our our motto was "Be the Lion." Be the Lion. That's always and, been your motto, right? And I said, "Look at this man." It, it, I don't believe in fate, but boy, is that is serendipitous. The universe was speaking to you. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the industry. You were so pivotal in the NAFTA renegotiation. Tell me a little bit about what you're most satisfied. Uh, what 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 gives you the greatest level of satisfaction with where the North American Free Trade Agreement is now? You know, for years. So so that was one of the, the NAFTA was one of the first uh, major international uh, trade agreements signed between you know, real developed countries. And then at the same time, the, the Europeans had gone through the Maastricht treaty to create the European union from the European common currency. And every single trade agreement signed after that had, uh, in their provisions for automotive content were always lower than the standards that we had set. So in, in NAFTA, we said 62 and a half percent of a car has to come from the region. And so part suppliers in all three countries knew that they had healthy targets to reach and, and car makers said we've got enough flexibility to bring in the cheap stuff from where we need it from then then we do a, a deal with korea we do a deal with the europeans uh we do the tpp with uh, the japanese the the vietnamese and the malaysians and the number goes from 62 and a half to 55 to 45 and in some cases 35 and what I said in all of those was, hey, man, we can't keep trading uh, some of these content provisions away that, that protect the auto suppliers in these three countries in exchange for access to more markets for the product that we grow on four legs. And so in, when we got a new government here, and, and just as the government changed in the U.S., Trump said, we're going to go for renegotiation. I said to the prime minister, we need to be in the room next door. And Christy Freeland, who's now the deputy prime minister, but she was the international trade minister at the time, she took us along at every single round. I went to every single round, man. We we hustled hard and trying to get that number back up, but trying to make them all understand that if you bring that number back up, but not too high, You'll have more activity for part suppliers in this country, but also in the U.S. and Mexico. Everybody wins. And then we can build a fortress North America to compete against China, uh, you know, Vietnam, Malaysia, some of these really competent but low-cost jurisdictions that may not actually be our allies. And so we ended up with a number in the new NAFTA, the USMC, at 75%. And I think that that means in this country – a 25% increase in shipments a year. That means six to $8 billion more shipments from the companies I represent just in this country. And it's so satisfying. It, it, it's a, the first real gain in 25 years. Yeah. Amazing. And the impact, of course, uh, there, there was the stat that a, a vehicle or the parts on a vehicle crossed the border. How many times is it, Flavio? Up, it's up to eight times, up eight to eight times. times, depending on what it was. Yeah. Which most people wouldn't know. Yeah. NAFTA renegotiation and Project Arrow, they're big swings, speaking yeah. of baseball. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the impact of taking giant swings. Yeah. Meaning, what does innovation like Project Arrow lead to? Does it mean more Canadians staying home to work? If they do, do they launch Canadian owned businesses? I know you're proud that you just had that, you know, you had your industrial design students play a big role in, in the vehicle. Did you teach them how to make big swings? I got to tell you, I you're getting to the heart of 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 what we hope to accomplish with something like this. It's been a hundred years or so since Canada's had a sustainable OEM, and these are things that matter. It's like living in a city without a major league franchise. You can have a great city, cultural, uh, educational, fun, but without that major league franchise, sometimes those boys and girls in that city don't think they can be football players or basketball players or baseball players or race car drivers. Well, we, what we wanted to do here was to show that we can do it, 
do it with Canadian students helping out in the design and in the build. Four of the players on our build team were fourth year engineering students at Ontario Tech University who I said, this better be on your resume. I mean, until the sun burns out, you know, <laughs> you're starting in a place where it took me 46 years to get to take it, own it. And we, what we hope that this vehicle does beyond telling the markets that, but for the risk capital in Silicon Valley, we have the same IT cluster here, but we have a better manufacturing cluster and access to critical minerals. You should do startups here in Canada. It, it, it makes sense. You can do it. But who's the you? It's not me. I want that that car guy, that car girl, who's choosing what university to go to, who's at a university or to trade, or working right now somewhere else in automotive to say, wow, they showed us we can do it. Now your dream has got to be bigger than my dream. I think we're going to have Canadian startups here, Canadian automotive startups, light vehicle, homologated, available at dealerships, competing with all the big players, I think as early as 10 years from now. And I think all of them, my hope, look back to this arrow exercise and say, God, you did the homework. You showed us the way. I'll tell you what we did is a month and a half before we showed this car in Las Vegas and nobody had seen the car. Uh, we went to a, to a middle school about an hour and a half from here, kind of a semi-rural town, Norwood public school, Norwood district school. And I, and we went, there was a, there was 180 kids. They were, they were grade six, seven, and eight. And we went there with this group called first robotics it's kind of, it's this, it's this not-for-profit that gets kids into robotics and, you know, robot teams and kind of get them uh, from 11 years old right up to engineering schools. And I said to the, the guy who reached out to me from there, who, by the way, was my grade seven teacher. Oh, Paul, geez. It all Paul, comes back around. <laughs> oh, man. Paul Keenan, he's like, hey, you, I saw you in the news. I think I taught you. And I said, well, I know you taught me. And you were inspiring. He said, can you come and do this? So we went to the school and we didn't tell them which one was the arrow. And I, we started taking, so I walked them through, Hey, look, is there a Canadian car company? Uh, someone said Toyota. I said, no, they're Japanese. What about Ferrari? Oh yeah. Well, Ferrari's going to know it's not. And we walked them through, Hey, listen, there isn't anybody doing this, but we're going to build a car. That's our first robotics project. And so we showed them and, and they were giving us feedback, you know, yays and nays, cheers and boos on all the different designs. And at one point out of order, I turned to Ashley who, who runs our communications here. And I said, give me the right one. I didn't tell the kids and I pulled out the arrow and I flipped the board. They went bananas. Hmm. And I said, that's the arrow. And everybody's, I go, now who wants one? And then everybody, we want one. And I said, no, I made one. And who wants to make one? And then I started walking through, you're 12, 11, 12, and 13 years old. By the time we get this thing to potentially a production version, 2026, 2027, and somebody takes it over the line to build a car company, you're choosing what university program you're in. And we need engineers, we need policy leads, we need smart people, we need people to go into the trades. And you guys are going to launch a car company. And you may call it the air, or you may call it whatever the hell you want. I said, but this is this is why you join First Robotics, but this is why this was important. And the kids were like, and I said, by the way, then we put up a video, and no one had seen it before. And we showed them the video, and I said, you can go home and said that we were here. And that we showed you stuff. You better have your phones away. Nobody better take pictures. I mean, I was playing it up a little bit, but they were like, and we left. They were slack jawed. We were slack jawed. And I said, you know, we're going back to that school with that car. And we haven't told them yet. Somebody's going to see this. And we're going to go back there in April and May with the car. We're going to go back to those same kids. I'm going to say, here's ours. Where's yours? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Is that the, is that where we're going to get to by 27 or 28? How satisfied will you be? Speaking of satisfaction, when the Canadian car company is launched, and this is the inspiration. I'll be the first guy to buy one. Yeah. I'll tell you, I, I, we're going to the Toronto Auto Show in two weeks. And I went as a kid all the time. 
And, you know, we're, our family's Italian. So, <clears throat> of course, we went to Ferrari and Lamborghini. And my dad's not a car guy. My dad is a government guy. And I'm sure I dragged him a few times there. It really was my uncle, my mother's brother, Tony, who used to take me out to the stuff. He was a real car guy. But my dad took me one time and I said, my dad was a, like I said, my dad delivered. I said, I want to sit in a Ferrari test. This is 1986. So it, it had been launched in 84, showed up in the market in 85. The first time I'd laid eyes on one, I was 10, it was in Toronto. And my dad said something to the guys behind the stanchion. Next thing I know, I'm in the Testarossa. And I got to tell you, man, I've been in I've been an absolutely unrepentant car guy since. Now I'm going back to that show, and our car is the lead car at that show. Hmm. And I think it's the first time it's a non-OEM car. First time ever, right? And I want everybody else's ten-year-old kid to be talking to their dad or their mom to say. I want to go in that one. And then when they're gray haired like me, um, they're running one of several Canadian car companies that are out there. Final thing. There's obviously government support on the prototype. Yeah. What does that mean that the government is playing such an active role in making sure that this happens? What is that? What's the signal of that? We see it in other countries, yeah. but what is, what is the signal of it? We spent so much time working with government during the NAFTA renegotiations. Then also when the world fell apart, and Canada, like the U.S., lacked a whole bunch of the PPEs required to fight the pandemic and ventilators. We converted our factories to do that. Um, biggest peacetime mobilization of, of, of industry in Canadian history. Uh, I think government's participation, in spite of the fact that some of their advisors said, this guy is a, this is a trade association. Don't don't get involved in a marketing exercise. I think they were saying thank you for what we did on the COVID response, but also our credibility in the NAFTA negotiations. And um, I can't tell you how many times I was asked, are you going to do it? And I said, on time, on budget. But when it comes, take a victory lap because without your initial support, our credibility to be able to do this, to go and recruit people like the engineers that we recruited and the designers and the build team, um wouldn't have been there and that and that you know we've seen both levels of government here and in both ends of the spectrum you know bipartisan really dive in on the on the major investments required to electrify the the programs that are built in canada and chase battery investments I, what i said to all of our government friends from the prime minister on down if there is a canadian legacy that comes from this own it because it's partially yours. No one's going to remember who I am. Maybe they won't remember who you are. Maybe they won't remember the investments that we made with the great assembly companies that are here. But if part of your effort leads to a complete rebirth of this idea of Canadian cars, like we had in the teens and twenties and thirties, um, I want to share it. And they are, they are, I mean, wait until you see the Toronto show, how many, how many ministers and heads of government show up. And I love it. It means that they believed in our vision and everybody's talking auto now. And I think I've done my job. Be the lion. You're be, be the lion. lion. <laughs> yeah, be the lion. Thank you so much for being the lion on this program. Always a pleasure, Jason. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks again to my guest today, Flavio Volpe, the voice and the face of Project Arrow as well as the head of the APMA in Canada. And to see my interview with Flavio, go to the Cars and Culture YouTube channel. Like and subscribe to see some 90 interviews. And thanks for listening to Cars and Culture. You can follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook, as well as on Instagram, at Cars and Culture SXM, and on Twitter, at Cars and Culture. I'm Jason Stein in Detroit. We'll see you down the road.